Hello and welcome to episode 114 of Do More With Your Money. I am your host, TJ Van Gerven. On today's podcast episode, I want to speak to you about avoiding the societal pressure of purchasing real estate, especially as your primary residence. This is one of the biggest topics that I come across as a financial planner on a regular basis, speaking with millennials as they've been told their whole life that owning real estate is part of the American dream, which is not inaccurate historically. A lot of our parents' generation accumulated most of their wealth from owning real estate as a large portion of their net worth. The thing that we have to remember is that it was a different time back then. The cost of ownership has outpaced the wage earner, meaning that your earning power hasn't kept up with how much it costs to own real estate. On top of that, It was a different interest rate environment. Now, there were higher interest rate environments in times like the 80s when they were trying to push down inflation and raising rates. But the early 2000s or the 2010s, for example, also had very low interest rate environments. Now, we've recently seen interest rates increase very fast at a fast rate. For example, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is about 7% now, which really isn't that out of the ordinary relative to historical perspectives. But when the cost of the real estate has not decreased, then you're seeing a massive increase in the unaffordability of owning that real estate. If you are feeling like you want to pursue a real estate purchase, then it's very important that you run the numbers and also ask yourself, what is the What are you trying to accomplish out of this? Are you trying to increase your standard of living? Meaning, are you just trying to have a a nicer primary residence? Because what you'll often find, especially if you live in in a major city, for example, I work with a lot of clients in Boston and New York suburbs, you'll find that a lot of times the math makes a lot more sense on just renting. For example, I was working with a couple the other day And we were looking at a $2.5 million purchase because that's the budget, the range that they're looking in for what they want. And when we really factor in the interest on the mortgage, property taxes, insurance, and honestly, not even any maintenance assumptions, which you can probably have about a 1% maintenance assumption. So for example, if you have a million dollar property, it's probably safe to say that you're going to spend on average $10,000 per year on maintenance, excuse me, on a $2.5 million property, you're looking at $25,000 in annual maintenance on average. And so when you actually run those numbers out, it's about $14,000 a month of recurring expenses that is separate from the actual principal payment on the mortgage. And if you're not familiar, the principal payment on the mortgage is how much you actually are putting towards equity, meaning how much you're actually putting towards the ownership of that property. And if you're not familiar, the way a mortgage works is there's a thing called an amortization schedule, which means that you primarily pay interest on the first half of the loan. And so if you actually look at your amortization schedule over time, if you look at the payments and how much the breakdown goes towards principal versus interest, you'll see that it's not until the second half of the loan. So for example, past year 15 on a 30-year mortgage, that you're going to start having most of your mortgage payment go towards principal. Meaning that if you don't stay in the property for a long time frame, I I typically suggest being in a property for at least 10 years. If you're not making extra payments towards the mortgage, towards the principal, then you're not really putting a massive dent in, in that principal, meaning you're paying mostly interest. And so what can happen is if you change properties a lot, then between the transaction costs of selling using a realtor, for example, And then the fact that you haven't been putting a massive dent in the principle of the mortgage, that when you actually factor these numbers in, a lot of times you would have been better off financially just renting. And and then you're saving yourself a lot of time, which you can factor in how much is your time worth and effort into having to sell a property. Because if you're just looking to increase your standard of living and you're not really sure where you want to be long term, an example for example, with the the client that I was just referencing, they may be better off just increasing their standard of living by renting a nicer place. And again, they were look the property they're looking at, which they can afford, would be about fourteen thousand dollars of recurring expenses. That is literally just expenses. It's quote unquote throwing away money. 
even though you're owning the property, quote unquote, you could spend $10,000 a month, have a very nice rental place that you're, you have, and then you have the flexibility to change down the, in the future, find a different place that's better. Don't have to worry about any kind of maintenance. Don't have to pay for anything that breaks down. Don't have to go through the hassle of selling your property. So really the main thing that comes down to primary residence ownership is, are you going to own the property for a very long time? That would be the, my number one question. Are you comfortable with having a large portion of your net worth tied up in a single asset that is non-cash flow producing? I would be careful about that. But the great thing about investing today, although it is difficult to get ahead in many ways, the access to investing in the global stock market, which I think it should be most people's benchmark for the opportunity cost of investing. So let's say that you can invest in the global stock market, right? Just say a world stock market index. We know that at least historically, you're looking at maybe an 8% annualized return, which is a good return over a long time frame. If you can stay disciplined and you can maintain a high personal savings rate and, and there's no property taxes associated with owning it, you only pay capital gains tax when you sell. Yes, there are dividends that come out of that, but it's probably 2% dividends. So you're paying a little bit of income tax on that. But again, if you're holding it for a long time frame, then it's going to be taxed at a lower rate than your earned income as a qualified dividend. And so in many ways, it's just way more practical, way more efficient to focus on your employment, renting a place that you really like, and breaking out of this societal pressure that you need to own a, your primary residence as part as your path to wealth. I just think that it's been impressed upon us by prior generations who they're not wrong. They have, again, built a large portion of their wealth via real estate. But again, the thing that they're missing is that the affordability has decreased substantially because of how much assets have appreciated relative to the wage earner. Even if you're a very high earner, it's still doesn't make sense in a lot of these major cities. Now, if you are looking to purchase in a place that has not had a long history of what I'd call old money. So for example, if you're looking at like a New York City or Boston, right? These are places that have relative to United States been around for a while. And obviously it's attracted high net worth folks, which have pushed up the real estate values. If you're looking at a younger city and the math makes more sense to buy versus rent, then that's a total different thing. Now you're still going to obviously want to factor in the interest rate environment and your holding period. But I just think if you are in one of these major cities and you're a high earner and you're not sure that you really want that lifestyle for the long term, yes, you can turn it into a rental property down the road. But again, do you really want to be a landlord? That does take effort. And a lot of times the return on investment there also isn't great. If you're already deep in the real estate game and you own multiple properties, then great for you. But if you're just entering this accumulation phase of your career and you don't come from owning a lot of real estate, then I just don't think the math makes sense in a lot of scenarios. To summarize this podcast episode, I would just say as a financial planner, make sure you run the numbers. Don't fool yourself. Don't fall into the societal pressure or you know propaganda that real estate is if you're just renting your real estate, then you're throwing away money. There are so many recurring costs to home ownership. And just because you buy a property for X and sell it for X, that is not your return. You have to factor in all of the recurring costs of ownership, the transaction costs of selling. And what you'll often find is that it is a better lifestyle decision to rent and invest the difference in liquid investments like the stock market, invest in your career, invest in your knowledge and your skills, increase your, your burning potential. That is where you're going to get the best return on investment. This house thing, this real estate thing, I really think is a shiny object and is a bit of a status motivator. And again, um, if you want to really you know, maximize your resources, you got to push away status. As humans, that is what we are going to be naturally pushed towards is, is status within our peers and maintaining hierarchy. But if you really want to maximize your resources, think outside the box and, and don't worry about what other people are doing or what they think about what you're doing with your money. 
So that is all I have for you on today's podcast episode, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.